Good morning, everybody. Who's had a good week? Nobody. Okay, who's had a great week? Ah, that's better. Right, I was asking the wrong question. Okay, um, have we got the little clicker thing? I forgot it. Um, this morning, uh, the last few weeks, I've been we've been uh, looking at pursuing God, and quite a few people have, uh, have given messages along that line. And this morning, I want to continue with that about pursuing God, but this morning with a bit of a difference, and I'll explain that very shortly. Thank you. Oh, right. Okay. This morning, our scripture has been Matthew six. 33 but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well let's pray dear heavenly father we thank you that we can seek you and lord that we can put you first in our lives and when we do that you look after us lord you you add all these things to us we just pray lord this morning that what you've got for us this morning will touch our hearts and give us something to go away and think about and that we can put into practice in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. I've got a little story for you this morning, and like all good stories, it starts with once upon a time. So once upon a time, there was a torrential downpour on a local town. The river burst its banks, and the district surrounding the town was inundated by flash flooding. And a very religious man found himself becoming trapped. As the waters began lapping around his house, his neighbour came by in a, uh, came rowing by in a dinghy and said, the waters will soon flood you out. Get in and I'll row you to safety. No, thank you, replied the religious man. I've prayed to God and I'm sure he will save me. The neighbour needed to save himself, so he rowed away without him. The waters continued to rise, so the man went upstairs And when the waters were coming up to meet him, an SES team came by in a motorboat and said, The waters will soon reach you. Get in and we'll take you to safety. No, thank you, replied the religious man. I've prayed to God and I'm sure he will save me. The the SES guys had other people to rescue, so they too went away without him. The waters rose even higher And soon the only place for the man to take refuge was on his roof. And as the waters rose above the guttering, a Westpac rescue helicopter arrived and lowered one of its crew on a line. The rescuer said, The waters will soon reach you. Put on this harness and we'll fly you to safety. No, thank you, replied the religious man. I've prayed to God and I'm sure he will save me. It was too dangerous for the helicopter crew to wait for the man to change his mind, so they flew away without him. The waters continued to rise until the highest point of the roof was engulfed and the religious man drowned. When he arrived in heaven, he was quite annoyed and demanded that St Peter arrange an urgent meeting with God and he soon found himself face to face with the Almighty. Lord, why am I here? he asked. I prayed for you to rescue me. I trusted you to save me from that flood and you let me down. You did not do what you said you would do. Why did you not save me? So God cleared his throat and took a deep breath and said, I sent you a dinghy, but you refused to get in. Then I sent you a motorboat, he continued, and again you refused to get in. Finally, I sent you a helicopter, God concluded, and you still refused. What more did you want me to do? Now, various versions of that story exist, and I'm sure you've, many of you have heard similar versions to that. Um, and uh, Monica told me that one many years ago, and I'd largely forgotten it. I was reading an article when I was preparing for this, and I came across that story again, and it spoke to me. So what is the moral of this story? Last week, Pastor Ben shared about seeking God in prayer. This week, I want us to look at seeking God and then recognising and acting on his response. 
The man in the story sought God. He called out to God. He had faith in God. He trusted God. But because God did not respond in the way the man expected him to, he thought God did not answer his prayer. Not once, not twice, but three times God answered the man and the man did not even recognise that that was God responding. He rejected those answers. I wonder how many times in my life that I've been seeking God, I've been asking him questions, asking him for something, asking him to tell me something and he's given me an answer and I haven't even recognised it. I wonder how many times, even worse than that, I wonder how many times he's given me an answer and I've rejected it. I wonder how many times that's happened. In Deuteronomy 15, 4 to 5, this is not working. Whoops. Technical difficulties? No, we're still missing. (laughs) What's going on here? This does not like me, I'm sure of that. We're there. Somebody's helping me. Deuteronomy 15, 4 to 5, it says, However, there be no... There need be no poor people among you, for in the land the Lord is giving you to possess as your inheritance, he will richly bless you. If only you fully obey the Lord your God and are careful to follow these commands I'm giving you today. The emphasis here is on fully obeying the Lord your God, to listen and to recognise the voice of God. So how do we recognise the voice of God? How do we recognise the voice of anyone? We do that by spending time with them, by walking with them, talking with them, listening and getting to know them and building a relationship. If I don't recognise Monica's voice, am I going to hear what she's trying to tell me? If I don't recognise when she does something good for me, what's likely to happen to our marriage? Hmm. How do we finish every argument? Yes, dear. (laughs) If we don't spend time together, then even after 40 years of marriage, we won't have much of a relationship. Yesterday we went to Sepplesfield and did something we both enjoy doing together. We went segway riding. It's the same with God. Now, I'm not suggesting you go segway riding with God, or (laughs) maybe, but you spend time with God. If you spend time with God, Spending time with God and enjoying relationship together. Seeking first his kingdom, entering into his space. And it enables us to build relationship with him and to learn to recognise his voice. Learn to recognise his hand at work, to recognise his response to us when we pray. Last Sunday, Pastor Ben talked about intimate communication, intimate language and bonding ministry. See, I did listen. Perhaps you might like to visit last week's message on YouTube. I once read an article about a trap we can easily fall into when we want something from God and without realising we can actually treat him like a vending machine. You know how when you're feeling a bit hungry you're, you're waiting in a hospital or you're waiting to, you know, somewhere and there's a vending machine there and you think, oh, I'm feeling a little, bit, a little bit hungry at the moment. You don't pay much attention to a vending machine until you actually need it. We go up to a vending machine and we drop in a few coins and out pops, uh, push a couple of buttons and out pops a packet of chips. When something goes wrong in our lives, we pray a couple of prayers telling God what we want and how he must respond. And what happens? Seemingly nothing. Then we wonder why. God is not a vending machine. But even when he does answer our prayers, do we actually recognise that answer? Do we actually see that he is at work, he's doing something in our lives? In Matthew 6.33, Jesus said, Seek first the kingdom of God. That means God needs to be first place in our life, not just a convenience, not just a vending machine. If God is number one in our life, then we will know his voice and we will recognise his response to our prayer. We will see that he's at work. 
Our journey of recognising God's response is not without struggle and difficulty. Every one of us has struggles from time to time. We wouldn't be human if we didn't. From, it, it's okay to be not okay. We all sometimes feel not okay and God knows that. He knows where each and every one of us is at any time in our life and in our experience with him. He even knows how many hairs we have on our head. So if he knows that, he knows a lot more about us than what we might think. When we have a close relationship with God, we can boldly ask questions and be confident of receiving answers. God does not expect us to just blindly accept everything that comes our way. That's not faith. But real faith allows us to ask questions and even have doubts. Otherwise, it's not faith but just blind acceptance. But real faith lets us talk to God about what we have a problem with. If we have doubts, if we have disappointments and discouragements, talk to God. That's part of building relationships. I would suggest it is not possible to engage one's faith without ever having some sort of crisis of faith. So let's think for a moment, and Pastor Ben touched on this last week as well, let's think for a moment about the anguish that Jesus was suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane. Let's have a look at the scripture. Let's see if we get it right this time. Hey. Hey. Thank you, Lord. Okay, Luke 22, 41 to 44. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Perhaps more than at any other time in Jesus' life, we see Jesus as being both fully human and fully divine. Folks, every one of us suffers anguish from time to time. Every one of us is heartbroken from time to time. And Jesus experienced that too. There is not one thing that any of us can go through in life that Jesus hasn't already been through. He understands He knows exactly what we're facing. So why can't we talk to him about it? We can. We will all have doubts and struggles and questions at times in our lives, especially when we're faced with trials and tragedies. If Jesus went through that, we can be sure that we will too. We would not be human if we didn't. But when we accept our doubts and questions, instead of trying to suppress them, we seek God about them. Then we can see his hand at work. John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We can talk to God about our struggles, our doubts, our trials, our ordeals, but when we need to listen, we need to listen to his answers. Only then can we learn to truly trust God for everything we need. Mark 1, 15, The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. What is that good news? The good news is that God is always there for us. He's he's never turning his back on us. In our story this morning, even though this story is a little bit silly, the man said that he had faith that God would save him, but his faith wasn't much use because he couldn't even see the solutions that God put there before him. James 2, 14 to 17. What is good, my brothers and sisters? Sorry, what good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. The man in our story had not learnt to recognise answers to prayer because he had not reached out to God in relationship. He did not seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness. Otherwise, 
he would have recognised the hand of God in his situation. His faith was very pious, but not at all wise. He was not able to put his faith into practice. Our scripture in James 2, 14 to 17 says, put your faith into practice. Don't just talk about it. Don't just declare it. Do something with it. And one of the things to do with it is to build a relationship with God and get to know God and recognise God at work. That is faith. Faith requires obedience to God and faith requires responding to God. Faith requires confidence in God and faith requires trust and listening to God. The man couldn't do any of that because he didn't have a relationship with God and he didn't even know that God had answered his prayers. 1 John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and will purify us from all unrighteousness. Can I suggest that if God is faithful and just to forgive our sins, then he is also faithful and just to help us with our problems. Can I suggest that he wants to build a relationship with us? Do we want to build a relationship with him? If he is faithful and just, then he is always available to us. Why would he say that he's faithful and just to forgive our sins if he didn't want to do that? Can I also suggest that he welcomes our questions and this is how we build relationship with him. This is how we're able to seek first the kingdom of God, by asking questions. It's that simple, folks. There's no hard and fast rules if you don't understand something, if you read God's word and don't understand it. Hey God, what does that mean? He'll tell you. He can't wait to tell you. God's door is always open. You know when you go into, if you go to a hotel and you stay overnight and there's a little sign inside that you hang on the door handle, what does it say? Do not disturb. God hasn't got one of them. He does not possess a do not disturb sign. He doesn't own one at all. His diary is never full. His office door is always open. It doesn't even have a door. With God, there is no such thing as a silly question. Luke 11, 9 to 13. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds and the one who knocks the door will be opened. What, which of you fathers... Uh, if your son asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake instead. Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If then, though you're evil, you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? If we make the Lord number one in our life, if we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then when we ask him for something, he will answer. If we ask for help, he will send help. He is the perfect father, so he's not going to play tricks or tease us. He will not give us a snake or a scorpion. He will rescue us. In our story this morning, he sent three rescue teams to save the man. God did not fail to keep up his end of the deal. I find myself wondering how many times God has made multiple efforts to get through to me but I've completely missed his attempts and gone off in my own way disregarding his way. I've got to put my hand up there. Deuteronomy 31.8 So 
The Lord himself goes before you and be will, will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Maybe this morning there are people here who've been looking for answers from God. Musicians, would you please return? Maybe there are some who have been wanting God to do some work in their lives. Perhaps there's some here who need a miracle. Perhaps there are people who've been hanging out for a touch from God, but it just seems as if, has anyone heard the saying, the heavens were brass? Has anyone ever felt like they've been praying and praying and praying and nothing's happening? Maybe that's you this morning. Maybe there are folk who really are feeling let down by God like our man in the story was. Can I encourage you, get in touch with God because the answer's probably right there and you haven't seen it yet. You know the saying where things happen and we say, oh, well, I'm too close to that situation? Maybe there's something going on in your life this morning and you're actually too close to see anything. But God's not too close. God's up there looking down or he's looking from some other angle and he sees a totally different situation to what you do. And he sees an opportunity for him to do something. All he needs for you to do is to reach out, have the ears open and eyes open and watch and listen and pray because he's there and he'll do something. That's a promise. It might not seem like it, but it is a promise. And it's not me making that promise. It's God making that promise. Do you know what God's response to your prayer might look like from God's point of view, not yours? Just like the man in the story, have you been speculating about how you think God should respond or are you asking him to reveal to you what he'll do? Are you listening for his answer this morning? Are you seeking first the kingdom of God and allowing him to, to do some work if that's you this morning get in touch with God let God do some work in your life and watch for the answer just like that man in the, in, in the flood God tried three times to save him don't be like that man don't be expecting God to do something different let God do what God's going to do now, there's a saying we say to people, do what you have to do. How about saying to God, do what you have to do and let God do what he has to do. Let God do things his way. And when he sends you a boat, get in it. Don't wait for another boat. Don't wait for a helicopter. Get in the first boat when that turns up and get rowed away to safety. Before the flood comes right up to the roof, Let's pray. Lord, I just pray that we would have the wisdom to be able to know when you're at work in our lives and to be able to recognise that and to be able to recognise the solutions that you send us. Lord, I just pray that we would be able to seek you first so that we know that you are doing the right thing and we don't have to try and tell you what that is. We can just know. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Yes, God is great. You can grab your seats just quickly. We're going to sing that song again because it is amazing. Ben mentioned last week that we had a special announcement and I'm very honoured and privileged to be able to tell you what that announcement is this morning. I'm a little bit nervous about it to be honest. For those of you who don't know the history of this church, started in 2010 the port church well really probably started uh, a long time before that but um, officially the church started in 2009 2010 we started having meetings at the sailing club down at lugs lugs bay um, for those of you who were there 2010 we um yeah we were there for a number of years and um it was awesome there was probably about 30 of us every week and we would have dinner together every week. Afterwards, everyone would bring something and we would sit together and eat. 
And this church, as you can see out in the foyer that's written on there, this church was started out of a vision to love God, to love each other, and to probably most importantly, that outward love, to love the community that we live in. And I can't remember exactly when it was, maybe 2011, 2012, we started talking about doing some outreach and pop up, as you all know it now, every Wednesday night here, you know, over 100 people, probably, you know, 50 odd volunteers that help for that to happen every week, started with a conversation <laughs> with three of us in my kitchen about how pop-up was going to start. And we started with a barbecue on a trailer. In fact, we didn't even have a trailer at, the, at that time. We started with a, a little pull-out barbecue at the, at the skate park down the road because that's what we felt God calling us to do. And I will say, you know, Pastor Ben has had this amazing vision for serving the community. And, of course, it's not all about Pastor Ben. You know, many of us here at this church are here because we want to love the, the people that are in this community. And the one thing I will say is, as a church, from a leadership perspective and, you know, even from everything that we do every single day, we are always driven to serve our community and to build the kingdom to build the kingdom for God and in 2015 through some miraculous circumstances we built a relationship with Lefevre Baptist who were in this building and they were meeting in the morning we started meeting here in the afternoons every Sunday they would meet in the morning we would meet in the afternoon one thing led to another and we became one church we became the Port Church, part of the Baptist Churches of South Australia. In 2017, we as a group of members made the vote to change our constitution and affiliate with the Baptist Churches of South Australia. And since then, it's been a great blessing. Hasn't changed us. We're still the Port Church. We still do what we do every day. Hasn't changed anything that we do, but we have become part of a bigger family. And there's been some great blessing in that in itself. Part of that blessing was being able to have some security and some foundation in this area, in, in the fact that we could have this building. And we have been operating under a memorandum of understanding with the Baptist churches for all intents and purposes. This is our building. And for those of you who were here know that the, the building was well loved and well used and you know all of the churches and the people that were here before you know had done amazing at being able to build this building you know even this in itself you know came from almost nothing but it needed some work and so you know we we wanted to be able to have a a beautiful building but the one thing that we've always stayed true to is that our calling as a church is to build the kingdom and we've prayed that God would build the building because you know our kitchen and our toilets uh, I know everyone has used them at least once I'm sure they they do need to be upgraded you know we we can't continue to do pop-up and serve our community and use this building to love our community without at some point doing that. And that's a significant investment. You would, you would know if you've been coming here long enough, the foyer, you know, was done basically on a shoestring budget. Lots of help from Joe and myself and Mao and Gordo. And, you know, there was a lot of hard work that went into, you know, building that, that foyer. And then we, you know, we were able to do some things in here and, you know, pretty it up. But it's a significant amount of money and a significant piece of work that needs to be done to be able to do the kitchen and the bathroom area. And we've been praying. You know, we, we had a vision. Um, I remember when we were looking at, at doing all of this, we, we knew the order that we were going to work in and we had a vision. We had no idea how we were going to do that. But we had a vision for what this place could be for our community. But I want to maintain that our focus has always been to build the kingdom not to build the building. 
And you know that saying, if it's God's will, then it's God's bill. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's not my, I don't know who I heard that from, but if it's God's will, it's God's bill. And that has been our, our mantra, our prayer this whole time. God, we know that we need our kitchen and our toilets refurbished to get them up to a certain spec, you know, disabled toilets, all that kind of stuff. But we have not known how we were going to be able to do that. We looked at grants and nothing ever kind of came up. Well, I can tell you that when it's God's will and it's God's bill, then God provides a way. And I'm very happy and excited to let you know that God has provided a way for us as a church to be able to upgrade the toilet in the kitchen area by way of an anonymous person who doesn't come to this church. I will stress that. They don't come to this church. They have seen what we're doing in the community and at pop-up and have wanted to bless the community and felt it on their heart to give the church... $200,000. $200,000. Yeah. Yeah. It is incredible. It's a it's an amazing amount of money. Most of us could only dream of having that much to be able to give to a church. But someone who felt it on their heart, who doesn't, don't even come to this church, can see the impact of us focusing on building the kingdom and want to invest in this building so that we can continue to build the kingdom. Over 12 years ago, You know, this church started with absolutely nothing. And now we are an amazing community of people who love God and love each other and love the community that we live in. And so we're really excited. Uh, I want to stress our focus is still always to build the kingdom. And we've started talks very early on to be able to look at plans for the kitchen and the toilet and, you know, we'll share those with you. And we have a greater vision, as I'm sure most of you do. We have a greater vision for this, this site and this area, all for the purposes of us being able to serve God and build the kingdom more and more and more. And so, like me, I'm sure some of you are overwhelmed It's hard to imagine and it's hard to picture. But just as Mao spoke about today so well and we've been speaking about, you know, God is in control. God is in control. God is the one who has a greater vision for us. All we've got to do is just take every day step by step and just keep being obedient. So that's the announcement. How amazing. Yes. I'm going to hand over to Pastor Ben. (sighs) How great is our God, hey? Why don't you stand up? You know, it's no accident that this has all happened at a time when we've been speaking and talking about pursuing God. What does the scripture say? Say it with me. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. There's no way we could have done the toilets and the kitchen without God doing something. Our week-to-week expenses are what we 
what we get in we get we goes out we, we don't have money left over as a church so we needed God to do something and God has encouraged us so powerfully just out of nowhere out of the blue unknown to us but has already donated a hundred and another hundred's coming and they've said it's to build those kitchen and toilets and whatever else we need so God is good God is good church And one thing we've done as a church, as Damien said so powerfully, is we've been faithful to do what God has called us to do. So whatever we've had come in, we use to love our community. Even just this this Wednesday night, we had uh, close to capacity here, 80-odd people from the community, 20-odd volunteers, and we were just loving on them, being true servants of God. And that's what this is all about. So we don't take any honour for this, but we give all glory and honour to God. And I want us to sing this song one more time as a praise declaration and a thank you to God to say, God, you are great. You are great. You are great. Come on.